subscribe and click the bell icon for the latest updates and notifications from the Indian Express. So how has been the season? Not really good for Rajasthan Royals, but as you have always insisted on processes and things that's in place, so that way are you happy with the way IPL went? Well, I mean, there's two aspects to it. One was fr from our, from the coaches' side, is did we do everything we could to set the players up for success? And I think, in terms of the practice, the preparation, the diets, the the new innovations that we brought into the game, I don't think I've ever done a more comprehensive job with a team in any T20 tournament um, and it's the player's responsibility obviously to perform on the field and the reality is it was a season of missed opportunities you know we had games really where the advantage was with us and it was about some of the senior players closing those moments out um, I think particularly you know the first game where we had the man cat incident against Kings 11 we we needed to score 39 and 24 balls with six wickets in hand you know we should win that but we handed it back and and twice to Chennai Super Kings, you know, it went down to the last over. Um, we needed to defend 18 with a ball and we needed to score in the other game at 12 with a bat. And we should have won both of those, but we didn't. Um, so it really is a, is a season of missed opportunities. It was probably our best team, the Rajasthan Royals, has actually put on, assembled in, in all of the IPLs. And it was our worst um, turnout. You mentioned marketing twice and I think it was a huge debate here that it happened. We remember that one image. Ashwin walking out, you walking in. Did you guys shake hands or you didn't even look at him or you had a very serious look on his face when you were crossing Ashwin, somebody you have coached well in. <laughs> what was it? What was your feeling uh, post the incident and now sitting here? Um, you know, again, it's debatable. There's the rules of the game and there's the spirit of the game and one can even debate the rules of the game. Was it within his bowling action and spontaneous or did he wait for Butler to fall out the crease and then run him out. So that's one debate. And the other debate is, you know, is that the kind of thing that a team or an indi indi individual subscribes to? And that's a personal preference. But walking off the field, not, virtually not one of his teammates looked any of our players in the eye. I know some of his coaches, coaching staff really well. They couldn't even look at them in the eye and they couldn't say thank you. To me, that was a very strong telltale that his team didn't necessarily buy into what had happened and all I did with him when I did shake his hand but, uh, but he never looked me in the eye and I know him very well and I just held his hand until such time as I believe as one man to another you stand up and you look at someone in the eye when you shake their hand and I just waited for him to sh look me in the eye before I let go. Uh, I think see I feel draws the best of brain as if you look at the teams and the coaches I think they are coaches Maybe the national teams also don't have that quality of coaching. We have Stephen Fleming, we have Ricky Ponting, like these are the kind of... And then you have Paddy Upton who doesn't have that kind of a cricketing record. Does you see yourself as an exception or a misfit or do, do, do you ever have a complex when you're facing a team of say, which has somebody like say a Ricky Ponting at the helm? 20 years ago, most people were happy to receive instruction from somebody who knew better. And that gave birth literally, and that method of leadership and coaching has been around since the beginning of the industrial era, which is early 18th century. So for 200 years, we've had this approach of the leader using a command and control, leader as content expert, authoritarian, top-down leadership approach. Not dissimilar to the approach that Greg Chappell used with the Indian team, of being the expert, which he really did have ex superior expertise, telling people what to do but that has fundamentally changed in the world today and it's changed through the internet we're now no longer in the industrial era we're now in the information age and what has happened is that content expertise that sat with the coach head coach 20 years ago has now is available on the world wide web and it is no longer possible for anybody to be the expert in almost any subject because that information is available and it's been upgraded every day on the internet. When, when I was first interviewed for the head coach of the Rajasthan Royals in 2012, at the time, in a way, I was like Gary Kirsten. When Gary Kirsten was offered the job to coach the Indian team in 2008, he had never coached a team in his life. He was a complete novice coach. He hadn't even coached his schools under nine team. Um, 
And similarly, I found myself in the same position when Rahul Dravid asked me to put my name into coach the Rajasthan Royals. Until that point, I'd been a fitness trainer back in the 90s in international cricket, and I'd been a mental conditioning coach. And in the interview, um, and I tell the story in the book, one of the members on the interview panel, in fact, Clive Woodward, who was the England World Cup rugby, uh, World Cup rugby winning coach in 2003, he said to me, so Paddy, I believe you're not actually a cricket coach per se which you're quite right in that I'm not a traditional cricket coach in the Ricky Ponting mold. And he said to me, so you're obviously going to get an expertise that you don't have. So you'll get a batting coach and a bowling coach and maybe a fielding coach to bring that cricket expertise that you don't bring. And his question to me was, if you have these expert coaches, they will be senior to you in the coaching world. Well, obviously, because anyone who coached was senior to me in the coaching world. And he said, how do you see the dynamic working now with you being head coach of these people who are actually senior to you? And do you see a problem in that dynamic? And my answer to him was, there won't be a problem. Because if you offer me the job, my prerequisite before accepting is I want no batting coach, no bowling coach, no fielding coach, and I also want no fitness trainer. I want no experts in the support staff which was met with the same silence that that's, that's being met with here. And someone leaned forward and said, what do you mean? And my answer, and this really talks to my coaching philosophy and talks to your question, is if you give me the position of head coach, you're going to give me 25 cricketers who come from five different countries. In this year alone, they planned a 25 different coaches, 25 different captains, each with their idea of how to play T20 cricket, and collectively, the team will have more than a thousand games of T20 experience. And that's the expertise I will use to build the entire campaign. So my approach to coaching is not the traditional coach of me being the expert telling players what to do. It's a knowledge or information era coaching approach where I harness the collective intelligence that sits within the playing group. But was it easier with the Indian team first assignment? along with uh, Gary. So Gary is the coach and you are the mental conditioning coach. People have to open up to you. How was that difficult? And I remember one thing in the book where after one of the meetings early on where you had a talk or a few sessions with the player where Tony comes out and tells you that Paddy, like you don't need to speak all the time, right? Yes. You don't play. So what was that about? So in coming into work with the Indian team, obviously we did a lot of homework before the time. Gary, first of all, had gone to meet the players when they went to um, play a test series in Australia shortly before we joined. He was there informally and he had a conversation with every player asking, what is it that you want from me as coach? So Gary already had direction from the players and one of the main things was that they wanted direction. After Chapel, there was about a six month period with a, with a caretaker coach and they felt there wasn't direction or a, a clear strategy. So the players wanted that. We also learned the unhappiness in the team under Chapel was not so much about his knowledge of the game, but it was more the method that he used to impose his knowledge on the team. So we understood what not to do. And I guess in hindsight, one of the greatest weaknesses were in coming into work with the Indian team in 2008, myself and Gary Kirsten, our greatest weakness was also our greatest strength. We didn't know these Indian players and we didn't know India. So we came in and we knew that we didn't know and we didn't try and pretend that we knew. So we came in with our ears wide open, our eyes wide open, our mouths largely, largely shut and we sought to understand the system, the players, what are the needs, what are the requirements, what can we do to serve you guys to take your game forward individually and as a team. And I think using that approach, the players soon realized that these guys aren't here to tell us what to do and try and control us or be these controlling authorities. They're here to work with us together for us to collectively figure out what is it we need to get to where we all want to go, which is number one test team in the world and to win the World Cup. So there was quite early, it, it wasn't immediate, but as players realized that these guys are here to actually work with us. Uh, and we use very much a servant leadership approach, which I think is, is, is less familiar to most Indians because they would have, most of them would have grown up with a very authoritarian, uh, their parents and their teachers and their coaches would have used a very authoritarian, um, dictatorial way with them. So we definitely brought a, a different way, 
But we already knew, as I said, from what Greg Chappell had done that didn't work, we knew not to do that. So the, the buy-in was slow, but when it came, there was a really genuine buy-in. Starting with the current setup, uh, where you have a captain like Kohli who is emotionally aggressive and I don't know if it's the right word, but slightly uh, higher side of the ego. Uh, as a player, what's your mindset like? Because if on the field, if you drop a easy catch or you don't perform on that day, uh, what's the conversation like in the dressing room? Uh, if, if, if a player is not maybe as emotional or aggressive yeah. as, as Kohli, yeah. It doesn't become very intimidating the atmosphere in the, in the dressing room? Two of the single biggest mental obstacles to success in cricket and probably any sport is fear of failure and pressure. And fear of failure and pressure, there's enough of that anyway. But when you get a senior player who is, gets very emotional around mistakes, that increases the fear of failure and increases the pressure and decreases the chance of younger players performing. So I guess in a way a long way around is it's, it does put pressure on players when you have particularly people that a younger player looks up to reacting negatively to a mistake. It increases the fear of failure and it increases the pressure. Um, so it's something that I think what MS Dhoni does so well is he rem is remains calm and composed regardless. And I would even take it to the next step. My belief is that if somebody drops a catch, particularly in an IPL game or a big game, can you imagine what it must be like to be a young player chosen in a team to play your first IPL season? There's 40 or 50,000 people in the stands, 350 million people watching, you journalists sitting there making notes on the game, and someone drops a catch. Can you imagine what that feels like for that person? What that person really needs is he needs the senior players to come running to him immediately, put their arm around him, give him love, give him support and tell him it's okay. I also want to know that there are certain kind of players who believe into this mental conditioning aspect of the game a lot and then there are these kind of players who are absolutely against it and then it's rubbish me. So how do you win the second lot over? So I don't. Um, and there is a chapter in the book that talks about my view on mental conditioning. And what I talk about there is that, or I talk about mental strength. And mental strength, I believe, is like Batman and Superman. We all know Batman and Superman and mental strength, but none of them exist. There is no such thing. Um, and briefly to understand that, the, there's just over 30 academic papers published in peer-reviewed journals on understanding mental toughness. And those papers are authored by just over 40 doctors and PhDs in sports psychology and psychologists. And I've been looked through all of those papers and none of them can agree on the definition of mental toughness or mental strength, number one. All of them say there's actually, there's actually no such thing. It's actually made up of subcomponents like grit and determination and focus and not being, not, uh, being distracted from your goal, etc., etc., commitment. Now, the problem with mental toughness is we think it's this macho, tough, unwavering, aggressive, whatever mindset it is under real pressure. The problem with that is anything short of that is labeled as mental weakness, mental fragility, someone soft. Now, the reality is that other than the odd out-and-out -out psychopath, which you do get them in sport and business, I've never worked or met with somebody athlete to the highest level of the game, a cricket or any other sport that doesn't have insecurity, doubt, vulnerability, negative thoughts. And I'd put it to you, is there anybody here who in the last week or two in your professional lives has had some doubt or some insecurity or some question about your ability or some negative thoughts? But we let, these things are normal. We all have them. And, but there is this understanding or expectation or this misconception that these athletes are not allowed to have this thing. And that is rubbish. So just wanted to talk to you about another talented player you have worked with, that is S. Srishant. So he was somebody, if he got up on the right side of the bed or he was in the right mental, mental frame of mind, he could <coughs> bowl very well, was excellent. But if he was not, he could go off the tracks. And like we know, he went completely off the tracks. So, but he was in a system which had someone like Rahul Ravid, 
who is a known mentor, you were around. So did you and you had set up such an environment in which which was which had so many mentors around. How do you think do you see a lack in it the fact that he went off the tracks and he indulged in marriage uh, sport with him? As with people who are bordering on genius, which he was bordering on genius as a bowler, um, often they, they, you don't just have that eccentricity on the field, it also off the field. And he was an eccentric personality. Um, and I'm not sure at the time that his eccentricities were actually embraced and accepted as opposed to more shunned. So I think his time in, in, in cricket teams in India was difficult because people didn't really accept him for being this eccentric individual. He was an artist and his behavior was not um, mainstream conservative as most male athletes are. Um, however, you know, as you, as you said, his, he went then beyond the realms of uh, what's expected even of someone eccentric and his involvement in uh, apparent match fixing was you know, that was very unfortunate that he chose that path. But I don't think when he was as good as he was, he was managed as well as he could have been um, as a, just a very different individual. First foreign coach said that he initially came, he saw people on the exercise bike eating a sandwich and how uh, Rick Chappell said that in his Indian dressing room during a team meeting, the juniors, even if they have a valid point, they don't speak out because yes. there are seniors around, right? Uh, what are your observations or which aren't, you were not, uh, you're not, you're not used to seeing because they're not part of your culture. How was the Indian dressing room different from what you've seen in South Africa? Something which were problem areas. Um, I think I was fortunate enough to, to really read enough, study enough and ask enough questions that when I saw things I had already understood at least something of them. And some of the stuff that I had learned that we needed to manage was things like young players not being free to, to speak up in team meetings. And I think that certainly is fundamentally changing in IPL teams now, which I'm very great. I'm very glad for young players that that's happening. Um, the other thing that I learned was that the Indian players would tend to not give direct negative feedback to us as coaches. So, Oftentimes, Gary and I would come up with a new idea that hadn't been employed in, in, in crickets before. And we would put that on the table and ask players, so, so what do you think about the idea? And almost every time, everyone would go, yes, that's great, let's go with it. But we under I understood at the time that it was more an out of respect for coaches and authority that people were saying, yes, we agree, it's good, than actually being honest about, yes, it's good. because. There is that reticence to give direct feedback because it's often seen as direct criticism. So we needed to work our way around and understand when someone said yes, they actually meant no. How do we actually get them to say, well, how do you see it working differently? So that was, I don't know, two, three months, maybe 20 of these inputs. We walked away at a practice and Donny walked up to me and put his arm around me and very subtly said, Paddy, don't think you always need to speak after a team meeting. <laughs> And it was so subtly put, but it hit me straight in the ego. And it's like, oh, no, you mean I'm speaking when I'm not, I shouldn't be and speaking too much. But players are always looking at me and going, oh. uh, But as I said, so, and I didn't know. Whereas if I did that in a South African context and players would sort of be going, you'd see in their faces, they're going, oh, no, he's going off again. <laughs> you, so you get that. But so it was those things that were really, we had to try and learn and understand and in fact, the, probably the, the best piece of advice that I got, and it must have been about three or four months into our tenure, and I was spending literally all my time reading business books and economy books and philosophy books around understanding India and understanding Indians and the DNA of the Indian psyche. And I was reading books written by foreign businessmen for foreigners about doing business in India and books written by Indians about for foreigners about doing business in India and I was reading yeah, and the, the Indian mythology. Myth, yeah the mythology and uh, what's the name Devat uh, Patayak yeah. how do you pronounce that name 
Devat. Yeah, so I was reading his stuff around Indian mythology and he's got some really cool stuff. And I, Robin Singh was sitting next to me when I was reading one of these books and he said, Paddy, I can tell you, you can spend all day, every day for 10 years studying Indian Indians and you will never understand Indian Indians. And that wasn't Robin being difficult and I realized that in hindsight and I have now been here 11 years, well, four to six months a year for, or three to six months a year for 11 years and that wisdom still rings so true is as a foreigner I come here and even though I do know something about Indian Indians, I know there's three or four layers beneath what I understand that I know that I don't understand. Um, and there's still, when I come here and I do work, I'm still not quite sure about a whole lot of things. But that's, it's, the nice thing about that keeps me humble, because I definitely know I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Barry spoke about uh, Dhoni quite a lot in the book. Uh, is he uh, the most un-Indian kind of a leader or a player? The way his the, the way he came across and tells you that it is not working, or the way he took charge, like you, you, that World Cup episode, you say that he taps the uh, window pane and said, "I'm going in," and yes. then you tell Gary, "I think he's going to win it for India." Yes. So this whole uh, uh, Tony, the mindset. Have you ever seen in any other Indian player, or you com can you compare him to say some player or some other team? He's clearly he has that the North Indian warrior fighter spirit in him uh, and I, I can see why he's so attracted to the military because he's got that real that warrior fighter instinct within him but he's also got the really clever strategic brain to be able to strategize games and understand tactics in the moment and also that steely composure of someone who I can imagine him being in battle under fire and him being composed and still understanding where are his troops and where the opposition and how does he need to take them out. So um, in that regard I can sort of understand when I look at that, you know, those, some of those famous uh, North Indian um, military warriors of in history and I read about them, I can see Dhoni in and some pieces of Dhoni in that. Um, but he's certainly, um, he's certainly different. Um, and I think that's what gets him to stand out, you know, things like his calmness and his composure, um, even under extreme difficulty and pressure. And that gives other players permission to be calm, like, okay, if Dhoni is calm, well, obviously we should be calm as well. So that really does spill over into the team. Um, and in terms of leading, you know, he was given a leadership position when you still had Tendulkar, Dravid, Laxman um, in the team, Sehwag in the team. So he was junior to them in a system that still had some of this remnants of seniority and authority in it. And he still was able to, from that slightly more junior position, lead without having to stand up above them or he was just really smart in his in his leadership even though he was slightly junior hi thank you a while ago you spoke about uh, the pressure on coaches uh, 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 and the pressure on you as well so how how do you handle it and what do you do does the doctor also treat treatment like do you have yes. someone you talk to so the more important we make a result in our head the more pressure we feel but that is all just a concept in our heads and if we're to then look at one level deeper, so why do we place a lot of importance on a result? Underneath that is because it's attached to our ego or our self-worth. So if I do well in an important game, I, I look good and I feel good and people write and say nice things about me. If I do badly and I fail, I feel bad, I look bad and people criticize me. So... And people really want, we want to look good and we want to not look bad. That is all a function of our ego. And in our ego, we're serving ourselves. If I boil down and look at, so what sits underneath that? That's a, a lack of self-esteem. So the more someone's self-esteem is grown, and self-esteem is knowing that I'm okay regardless of whether I succeed or I fail, people say good things or bad things. I know deep within myself, I'm okay as a person. Carrying forward from that, at what stage of your coaching career were you most mentally vulnerable? There was a period, I mean, 
you had a very successful team. But at that time, the Indian team coaching staff was all about Gary Kurtz. It was Gary. Yes. When you talk, when you spoke about the support staff, it was Gary. The lower yes. levels. I mean, you're not on the radar. Was that the most vulnerable point of your career? I mean, at the time, you were most successful at the same time. Um. It was the time that I made the biggest mistake of my professional life, but I wouldn't say it was the most vulnerable. The most vulnerable is, has been losing. You know, that's, that's been the most vulnerable time, but certainly that time with the Indian team, it led to my biggest ever professional error, which I talk very candidly about in the book. Can you and I'm happy to share it. Uh, yes, I can. So. So a number of people at home were phoning me, my family and friends, and saying, Paddy, we're all seeing this Indian team is doing so well, and Gary is getting all the credit, and you're not getting any credit. And I remember at the time saying, number one, my job, and believing my job is not to get credit. It's not to be seen to be good, doing a good job. My job is to do a good job. But people are saying that Gary's using your words, that you've been saying this for 10 years. MS Dhoni is, is using your words that you've been saying 10 years ago, but you're not getting credit. And, but there was a little part of me, which is my ego, that would have liked to get some credit and would have liked some publicity for what I was getting. But in my wisdom, I knew that wasn't important at all. It was only the inner ring that needed to know. Um, but then South Africa went to, uh, we went to South Africa to play the Champions Trophy. Champions League or Champions, I always get it wrong, Champions Tro Trophy. And going home to South Africa, 18 months in the tenure with us, surging Indian cricket team that was an opportunity to really put our work on display and we had come up with some really nice glossy folders where a lot of the workshops and the information that I'd given players was really cool information was in these folders and one of the things that I had done a whole lot of research around was the impact of sex on performance and testosterone and I looked at it from a Chinese medical perspective and chi energy I looked at it from different religious perspectives. I look at it, looked at it from a biological and a physiological impact of testosterone, main, holding it versus spilling it on the end. And so a number of different angles and was a fascinating body of research. But I know players don't read three pages of research stuff. So I put a lot of tongue in cheek through that article and diet articles. I put funny stuff in, in it just to keep the players interest and cracked a few jokes. And I knew these documents were printed at some printer's office. I knew they went to the BCCI and they sat there for a while. Then they went to the team manager. Then they were distributed to the team and a player could easily, one of these things could have been leaked at the printer. Stuff was always leaked at the BCCI office. Um, one of the players could have left it lying around. Someone could have leaked it to one of their friends. So I justified to myself in my own head that there was a journalist that I knew who, who was a fan of my work and I leaked it to him thinking that he's going to now read through this and write an article on the fantastic work that Paddy Upton is doing behind the scenes in this revived Indian cricket team. Um, and he did a write a, a really good article except as happens in the media is some of my tongue-in-cheek comments around the Indians was taken out of context. I woke up the next morning and I turned my phone on and just went beep, 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 and I knew something's wrong here. And I went and I started scrolling. People said, are you okay? Have you seen the news? Is everything all right? And I'm going, what? What's going on here? And I turned the TV on and I saw all the channels running story that Gary Kirsten suggests the Indian cricketers have sex before performance to improve their performance. Um, and we all remember, I'm sure, the sex scandal and what was made matters even worse, we arrived at training that morning and this news had broken and Gary, his wife, he's a very uh, religious person. His wife's father is one of the leading Christian evangelists in Africa. So he's got a very, very close knit, strong Christian community that this had brought disgrace on them because the article said Gary Kirsten said the players must do this. So. He had been disgraced, his entire community had, you know, he'd been disgraced in front of his community. We arrived at practice and Sachin called everyone in. Now Sachin doesn't often talk in meetings and before practice, but when he does, people listen. 
And I don't quite remember what he said because every word was like an arrow through my heart. And he said, somebody has leaked this document. Somebody in this team. And it's hurt our coach. It's affected our team. And it's absolutely unacceptable. And whatever he said was very emotionally charged. And it just, I was just shrinking because I was that guy who leaked it so that I could get some recognition for myself. And I needed to go to Gary afterwards and I did and I said Gary was me and I told him as I've told you exactly why I'd done it um, and I remember arriving back at the hotel after that practice and I bumped into Gary's wife who she was waiting there and she was devastated and I remember getting off the bus walking up to her and in in tears stumbling out an apology saying Debbie it, it was me who did that uh, and I'm terribly sorry and this is why I did it and I understood the impact on her and her Christian community. Um, and Gary had got to the point of he was ready to resign if, if the BCCI needed a scapegoat. So in looking for attention and recognition for myself, I ended up hurting a friend of 20 years, someone who I'd spent 18 months really building up and trying to support and caused considerable amount of damage to the Indian cricket team's reputation and to Gary's reputation as someone who'd never had controversy in his entire cricket playing and coaching career. And I did that because I acted out of ego. So for me, that was comfortably my head and shoulders, my worst ever professional experience, one of my biggest ever mistakes I've made professionally. But in hindsight, one of the greatest gifts because I really got to see just how ineffective we can be when we operate out of ego, particularly in a position of leadership or influence uh, because I acted to serve myself when up until that point my whole job was to serve Gary and to serve the team and that stands still to this day as a very strong reminder that it's not about me as coach it's about serving the people that I'm charged to serve in my leadership position. But you also say, you said that in the interview that parents need to lay off the young players the kind of pressure yes. they put which is quite the same in India and Pakistan. Yes. Like, how is that important? In the United States 40 million kids start playing sports when they start school. By the age of 13 years old, 70%, 28 million have given up sport. When asked why, the main reasons are one is parents and two is coaches. And parents, it's, it's parents putting pressure, parents over coaching their kids. And from coaches' perspective that cause 70% of these kids to give up sport and to stop enjoying it, is the win at all costs, too much pressure, shouting, reprimanding, um, and, and placing high expectations on kids. So that is ruining kids' sports participation, number one. So parents and coaches have got to back off. Kids need to be allowed to be kids. What we're seeing the most successful athletes, compared to equally talented athletes who give up the game or get burned out, is number one. Up to the age of 15 years old, they need to be playing two, but ideally three sports up to the age of 15 years old because the transfer of those skills of those different sports and the, trans the brain stimulation that happens sets them up for longer term success. If they stay in one sport from a young age, the brain becomes desensitized and the learning just plateaus. Um, burnout happens way too much and the other thing that has been proven in, in various sports, not in India, they haven't done the research yet, is success up to the age of 13 has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on how successful someone will be by the age of 18. So if your kid is a superstar anytime up to the age of 13, it means statistically nothing.